Hi there. Good morning, everybody. Um, if you want to see the presentation this morning, can you turn off your Wi-Fi? Can, can everyone turn off their Wi-Fi? I'm really sorry about this, but the Wi-Fi in here is so appallingly bad. That our only chance of getting Jonathan's presentation up is if you turn off your Wi-Fi, I'm told. So can you disconnect yourself from the internet, please? Just Okay, I think we've got the technical glitches figured out. Thank you for coming today. I am Jonathan Albright from Elon University. I'll do it in turn. Sure. Great. So yeah, we, we think we can do this now. Um, you may have seen the news this morning. You may have seen the news from Syria. Um, about that the Americans have launched cruise missile strikes uh, in Syria, which I think reminds us that that American presidential election was incredibly important. And in a sense, perhaps, we've been kind of laughing about the idea of fake news, always with inverted commas, fake news, but it has real consequences. Um, today, we're, we, well, you've been talking uh, uh, the last day or two about um, fake news, what it looks like and how you can verify it and how perhaps you can identify it and even stop it. But this morning we're going to look at how it spreads. So not the creators of it as such, but the people and the mechanisms by which this content, this viral content, which is often hoaxes, but often very partisan uh, political messaging that seeks to influence people and, of course, uh, particularly at elections. But how does it spread? How much of it is there out there? And what kind of impact does it have on uh, the information ecosystem where all that other uh, uh, political information travels? Jonathan Albright from Elon University has done some amazing uh, mapping of the uh, spread of fake news with some extraordinary uh, visualizations, which we hope you're going to be able to see. The screen isn't huge, but um, he'll be able to talk you through it. And by all means, go to Jonathan Albright's page on Medium, for example, uh, where you'll be able to see in detail 
uh, the, the graphic visualizations of his research. I first saw it back in, when was it, Jonathan, was it in the autumn? You were November. November, uh, started to do it, and it blew my mind. It was a bit like, you know those incredible, uh, the Hubble telescope, when you can peer into these distant galaxies uh, and see the uh, vastness and the way that it, the, the planets move. Well, for me, that was um, the similar effect of Jonathan's work. And what we're going to do, Jonathan's going to present for about 20 minutes, half an hour, um, trying to show you at least, if you've got good eyesight, um, uh, the, the results of his research. And then we've got a special bonus for you this morning. We've got Renee Kaplan, who is head of audience uh, engagement engagement at the Financial Times, who is somebody who spends a lot of time looking at data. We're going to have a quick conversation about what does this information mean uh, for us, especially as journalists, trying to understand uh, this phenomenon of fake news. So over to Jonathan. Thank you, Jonathan. Good morning. Okay, so I hope this is a, I have the only data visual, well, I have a, you know, one of the few data visualizations I hope you can see some of this, um, but like Charlie said, you can go to my Medium page and you can kind of look through some of the larger visualizations if you wanted to kind of follow along. Um, this is a topic that's extremely difficult to fit into a, a, norm, a regular kind of presentation, so I did my best to kind of zoom in on facets of, of what I've kind of mapped out to show uh, segments of this and then I'll, I'll put it back together in terms of conceptually and make kind of more sense of this. So where this... Where this came from is after the election, or, or shortly after the election, I was kind of frustrated to find information about, uh, you know, what had kind of happened in terms of in terms of the the kind of election results, the unexpected polls, and what we, you know, what I what I was looking what I was looking for, I couldn't find, um, and there was a lot of talk about Facebook and about Twitter and about how these uh, platforms had skewed the election, but I was more interested in seeing some of the other components of of how these systems kind of come together. Um, I've called it micro-propaganda, and I'll, co I'll, come, I'll come back to this. And I think that fake news is, is a problematic term. I mean, I, I, I use it in my research, but I do understand that there's, you know, it's a weaponized term, and there's a lot of different ways that you can um, say fake news. I mean, in terms of, you can even call organizations are called fake news now. So it's not just content that's fake news. I mean, they're now kind of ascribing that label to, to even organizations. So. Fake news is kind of part of this, but I think the larger, the larger question is the system level and to look at things on kind of the level of the system. And one of the things about how these systems come together and the platforms come together and content sites, publishers, um, is, is not really, it, it's very difficult to kind of conceive in your, in your head and, and kind of map this out. So what I did in my research um, is I, I started looking around at how data was being used to target people. And this is something that's not new. Advertisers have been using data to target people um, for years, since the internet you know, existed. So I think that one of, the, one of my main questions wasn't about the effects of, of the content or the, or the kind of campaign messages, but more about, um, more about the sources. And one of the things that kicked off my research is I started looking around for uh, Brexit. And this was, you know, this came Bef slightly before the presidential election in the United States. But this is, you know, the first result that came back for why Brexit won was InfoWars. And I just thought that was, you know, I thought it was so unusual um, that that kind of topic, either InfoWars would be the top result on this. And it, it really confused me. So I started looking at other types of um, channels where these, you know, this kind of influence or this, this, this election influence could, could be coming through. Google obviously be one of them. And when I looked at some of the traffic sources, what I was seeing is that you know a lot of these, a lot of the traffic, sure, it comes from Facebook, it comes from Twitter. But what I was, you know, what I started to realize is that a lot of it was direct referrals, direct URL referrals, and also coming, you know, a lot of it was organic search. I mean, some of these, some of these very, very fake news sites have, um, and when I say fake, I don't, I don't mean fake in the sense, you know, of hyper bias. I mean, I mean genuinely kind of almost uh, hoax sites. Uh, a lot of their traffic is is coming from organic search. This is unpaid. This is not something that they're you know they're, this is not search advertising. So it was it really in, it made me interested in, in how this is happening. I mean because when you rank the web, there's kind of there's a there's a relationship and there's page rank and there's there's connections that are measured by sites like Google who index these um, to give you to serve people search results like the one that I showed with Infowars and Brexit. So. 
I started to realize, you know, it's not really, when we talk about big data, I think that big data in the context of targeting for elections is more, you know, I think a better term for it is actionable data. Um, it's data that's being used specifically to reach specific people. So I think the, this, this, is, this marks kind of one of the, 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 the tail end of, of what I would say is the mass communication area into more of a micro communication era. Um, so a lot of the audiences now are focused more on trends. They're, they're focused on, on, they look at the trend first, they find the audience through the trend. Or they, or they, you know, they, once they can identify certain types of trends, they know they can reach certain types of individuals or consumers uh, for short windows of time. So there's companies that, that do this type of thing. I mean, this falls into the broader category of programmatic advertising. Uh, but when you look at the sentiment around some of these you know, real-time trends, one of them is the election debates um, in the United States, the primary. Um, you know, all these candidates are viewed as negative and there was, there was a lot of outrage. Um, and out of all of the um, primary frontrunners in the, in the US election, you know, Donald Trump had far more negative sentiment um, than any of, any of the other candidates. And all of them had kind of, were kind of in the red in terms of in terms of sentiment or in terms of how people felt about them. So I think that looking at sentiment and looking at kind of how you target people based on emotion and how you target people, how you kind of grab their attention or you know, get, get their, your message to them and, and have it reach and have it make an impact is to, um, is to get them at certain points where you know, you, you're, they're, they're susceptible to the message. And I think with, with newer forms of media, especially things like Facebook, we can measure that and we can see the results and the impact that we have that certain types of messages have. And, you know, so companies that have programmatic access to Facebook's API can run, you know, hundreds if not thousands of, of customized messages at the same time and see, the, and see the results. And this isn't anything that's, you know, this isn't that much different than the regular web. Most websites are running, uh, scripts like Optimizely to, to make you know, more sense and to do testing and to see how new features work or new, new types of designs work on their websites. So a lot of these things aren't new. I just think it's, it's the kind of, it's how they're coming together, um, especially in terms of data and politics, that's very important. So I don't have a whole lot of time, I'll keep going. So this is, you know, these are the kinds of, you can, it's hard to see, but you know, when you kind of when you when you're able to capture real time sentiment, I think that this is this is one of the key parts of of understanding this new media ecosystem, um, because then you're able to go back and target people based on anger, based on happiness, based on you know awe. There's there's a lot of different kinds of virality um, in terms of sharing that you can target based on directly on emotion. Um, and I think that you know out of all of them, a lot of research has proved that you know, that anger is one of the most, you know, when you get people angry about something, the, you know, the activation in terms of reaching others and, and sharing is, is, is very strong. So just to kind of taper this off, I've called it the data industrial complex because I felt that there was, um, there was kind of, there was a very, very targeted specific, um, almost, almost like operational um, military type of use of data. And, and it's big data, but it, more importantly, it's actionable data. It's data that you can use to reach people at certain times. So this is another message, um, and you, it's hard to see, but it's, it's basically, you know, when I searched for Facebook for why Brexit won, the exact same thing as Google, I started getting messages like this. And this is from a site called Truthfeed. And I would say this is a very, very hyper-biased um, fringe fringe politics site that's quite, it's, I mean, it's controversial. So the, the kinds of messages that people are receiving um, are, is very important and it goes, it goes far beyond Facebook, it goes far beyond Google, it goes beyond any specific or any individual platform. Um, I've called it micropropaganda, so when I started mapping these out, um, what I did was I took some of the lists that were, that were being circulated, um, one of them was from Melissa Zemdars and I, I added to it, I kind of, I vetted it. There were certain sites that weren't, that didn't exist at the time, um, right after the election, some of them have been taken down. Um, but, you know, I was able to capture, you know, a slightly over 100 sites in the beginning of more of the very, very fringe sites, the hoax sites, the viral sites. And when I started to look at this, I realized that it's a different picture when I started to map it out in terms of the connections. So my research really doesn't involve content. It, it involves the relationships and it involves the connections, which, I'll, which will take me to the next slide here. Um, so my, my focus in particular isn't, isn't trying to define fake news, isn't trying to, you know, I'm not, I'm not looking at fact checking. I'm really looking at where, where is this content coming from originally and, and how, do, how is it flowing? So how is it, the, the circulation is very important on this. And 
relationships suggest a lot. I mean, we, we, can't, we can't imply everything from relationships, but if links exist between um, organizations, if, if they're news organizations, if they're, um, if they're kind of think tanks, um, if they're news, I mean, mainstream news, like alternative news. So I think that, that understanding the relationships and how the connections exist between these different actors is very, very important, and I'll talk about why. Um, through a system level analysis, this is extremely difficult to see, but you can kind of you can kind of get a sense. This is this is the this is the landscape of, of what I would call the kind of political media ecosystem, and and what you can see is that there's there's a well first of all there's there's more links going out on the I would call it the right wing sites. They're, they're, they've populated you know they're they're almost ubiquitous in terms of the news sphere. So this would be the entire the entire kind of internet sphere. So this would include these include you know Twitter profiles. This includes Facebook pages. This includes so this goes much further than social media. Um, but what you can see in these types of maps is that you can see these ideological separations. So the top, the top right corner on this is kind of where the, I would call the left-wing media are concentrated and kind of huddled. They're not well linked in to the rest of the, the systems. So you can see YouTube is kind of, is on, the, is on the bottom left corner there. And it's really, if you look closer on that, you'll see that InfoWars is kind of right next to YouTube. So the kind of leveraging, the kind of use of free tools um, including YouTube, which very much helps to get content out. It's one, you know, it's the second largest um, site on the internet, and it's a very important search engine as well. Um, you can see that this, you know, this is this is a kind of it's almost like a strategic battle position that you would have back in in, in the war era. So, so when you go and you look at some of these links and where they're pointed to, um, one of the first sites on this, you know, on my first round of analysis was Southfront. Um, and Southfront is a, I mean, I'll, I'll call it a very politicized and fringe um, organization. Um, the second result on these kind of individual URLs that are that are that are pointing out of um, hyper biased and fake news sites was IP masking. So, and I, you know, once you start to look through these types of um, links and where they're pointed, it starts to make a little bit more sense. Um, so, what I noticed when I was doing this analysis is that, uh, you know, you can see where these actors are positioned. So it, it's a relative positioning in terms of network analysis. It doesn't matter exactly, but it, the distance does matter and the kind of centrality of where these actors are placed matters. So you can see that Wikipedia and Russia Today and Reddit and WikiLeaks are kind of right next to each other. Um, so this kind of, this, this, this does suggest that there is a relationship in terms of, in terms of content or in terms of, you know, flows of information between WikiLeaks, Reddit, uh, and Wikipedia. So when you go back to look and think about IP masking and look at the individual links heading out there, um, you can kind of tell that you know, people are likely using IP masking to make an, uh, contributions to Wikipedia. So to kind of hide their IP address and maybe make multiple contributions once they're banned. Um, so these types of, this is very strategic. Um, and you know, it, it possibly WikiLeaks information or information that WikiLeaks has has, has pushed out um, is likely being integrated now into parts of Wikipedia. So tracking that part is, is, a, is a whole nother endeavor. But I mean, this, this, the maps can, can lead you to other places and give you a sense of what to look at next. So here's a, here's a closer view of kind of YouTube. Um, Zero Hedge is you know right around, kind of populated on YouTube, and Prison Planet is, is directly next to these. Um, this is logical in some in some sense because the large news organizations typically don't use YouTube as their primary uh, multimedia content channel. Um, the New York Times or, or Washington Post, like they'll typically, you know, they're not using YouTube channels to get out their message. But most of the smaller kind of fringe um, political sites are, um, and this helps them. We don't know how much, but it does help them in terms of uh, search ranking and 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 kind of boosting their their presence because YouTube does have influence on on Google search. So you can see these types of relationships in terms of uh, kind of, I call them follow clusters. And so what you get when you map the entire internet and you kind of go beyond Facebook and Twitter is you can understand how the, these kind of maybe blog type uh, sites and the very smaller uh, think tank sites are kind of form these interest clusters and you can see the dots there, but these are combinations of Twitter profiles, Facebook pages, all sorts of different sites, and they're all linked together because they're linking into uh, someone on the right there. You can see that's Donald Trump's Twitter. 
So the, the, you know, all, a lot of actors have these, or opinion leaders, I would call them, have these kind of follow clusters or of, of links coming in. So again, this has nothing to do with content, and I think that that is very important in terms of understanding the structure of the, I'll, the fake news ecosystem. It's, I know it's a dirty word. So the second thing I did in my research is I went back and I wanted to look at not the kind of not the not the visible part of the network, but maybe more of the invisible part of, of the internet. So I went back through using a tool that Mozilla makes. Um, it's called Lightbeam, and it collects and forms a network of the trackers that lie underneath this kind of ecosystem. So when I went back through on the same group of websites, I wanted to see how people were being tracked across all of these uh, fringe sites. And I've called it the privacy death star. Um, because it kind of looks like a Death Star from Star Wars. And in the middle of this, I mean, there's a lot of, so every, every time you visit one of these sites, and again, this isn't anything new on the internet. I mean, often when you visit a site, you'll go to multiple parties. But so it, out of these 113 sites that I, that I looked at, you know, I visited more than 400 third parties. Um, some of the third parties are in other countries. Some of them are just IP addresses. They're, I mean, some of this stuff is very sketchy. Um, I tried to follow some of these links back. Um, reverse IP tracing, you know, it's, it's pretty much a lost cause to try to understand that. But the fact is, is that a lot of these um, sites, I, in my opinion or in my research, it looks like they're being set up to kind of not only to serve people content, but also to track them and to target them. Because once you visit these sites, whether you're outraged or whether you agree with this, um, it will obviously load kind of cookies and other types of scripts that will track you from that point forward. So they, they can understand the response. There's, a, there's a, almost like a real-time measurement in terms of this fake news um, through trackers. And in the middle, it's, it's difficult to see, but you can, you know, there's Facebook. Because all of these sites uh, heavily rely on Facebook's like and also their connect uh, infrastructure. So when I was looking at some of the, the pages of, of these fake news sites, so this, this is content, but this is more infrastructure. Um, you know, these sites called secretofthefed.com, I mean, they're, they're very conspiracy-oriented sites, just have Facebook code posted everywhere. I mean, it's, it's, it's prompting you. And, you know, my argument is, is that people who are true conspiracy theorists probably aren't going to like secretsofthefed.com on Facebook. I mean, I just don't think that's, I think that it, it, doesn't, really, it doesn't really match up. Um, so, you know, they're, they're pushing emails. So when you, when you go to these sites, like when I looked at the links coming in, the referral links, direct URLs, email referrals, and also organic search, you know, you can see that uh, they're heavily pushing email. And email isn't glamorous. I mean, studying email is, is old. It, it's the oldest form of social media, really, in terms of digital social media. But I think that, you know, overlooking these is, 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 a, is a mistake. And I think that, you know, we do need to go back and look at email lists. We need to look at how this was promoted through, um, through different types of avenues other than social media. But the social media part is very important in tracking. So most of these sites, when you go here, they, there's a pop-up and there's kind of an, it, it comes across and it either tries to get you to uh, sign up for the email or it tries to get you to, the, you know, they're even doing kind of a social engineering and there's a pop-up here that says, would you like to see Hillary in prison? And it says, click like if you agree, and you kind of have to get around that. So you answer the question. I mean, these, these sites are putting up barriers and having you try to answer a question with a Facebook like. You know, I, don't, I think that's a little bit unusual for a politics site. So, but, it's, but you can tell it's based on emotion. I mean, these, they're, they're kind of, there's, a, there's a little bit of targeting on emotion. Um, people talk about Twitter being inflated as well, you know, the metrics on Twitter and, and Twitter being distorted. I would say, you know, Facebook has a, a similar problem. And when I went back to some of these sites and, and counted their likes on their, on their Facebook page that was linked back to the site, you know, we're talking some of these sites that you've never, very, very small sites, minor footprint, you know, had millions of Facebook likes. And I just, I can't see how that would be. And I mean, there's, there's a lot of fraud in this. I mean, you can go and buy Facebook likes if you, if you want, but it doesn't make sense for a site that, you know, almost that is a minimal, minimalist blog that has nothing, very little traffic to have 700,000 Facebook likes. It just doesn't make any sense. So I think that this is another thing that I saw is that there's a, there's a lot of inflation going on here in terms of, of, of lifting these sites up and, and providing a, a sense of support that actually doesn't exist in reality. So, you know, they're collecting real-time location info as well. I just think, you know, to be cognizant of, of these types of things and to be understood, you know, part of my goal was to, you know, some of the audiences that, that do go to these sites is to, is to make them more aware of the privacy implications and the, and the kind of tracking that's going on. 
Um, so I'll move on to I'll move on to kind of looking at the left wing and the right wing ecosystem. So when I was talking about the huddle and how kind of the larger mainstream left wing media are are concentrated in kind of their own corner, they're not heavily linked into the rest of the internet. I would say in terms of the news sphere, they might be linked into other parts of, but in, but in terms of the news sphere, they don't appear to be heavily linked in, and. By discussing with, um, there was someone at the New York Times that I was talking with, and he said that you know they they don't link to Donald Trump. Like often, often they will post, they encourage uh, screenshots instead. So because every time you give someone a link, you are you are establishing a connection between even if even if it's something where you're you know you're arguing against whatever this Infowars has posted by giving them a link and not adding a tag like a nofollow tag, you are essentially boosting their, their profile even more. So a lot of this is, is, is about link trolling. And Media Matters, uh, I, I realized a few days ago, um, there was, you know, these, these sites, and Media Matters is, I went back and saw Media Matters had, had posted all sorts of links um, to Infowars. I mean, dozens if not, you know, close to 100. So it's, it's a big problem, and I think that there is a technical understanding for content management systems to, to start to integrate uh, tools where you can add a nofollow tag, where they're not getting link credit when you're linking back to try to you know, pick apart their arguments or to try to counter their, with, you know, these things that Infowars and other sites post. Um, so there's other aspects of the kind of ecosystem that you can analyze through links as well. And Links out is one of the, you know, there's LinkedIn, but there's also kind of links heading out. And when you look at the sites that are, that are acting as the hubs or the kind of distributors of a lot of the fake news information, um, you know, links lead you back to sites like Conservapedia. And a lot of people have never heard of Conservapedia, but these sites, you know, it, they're, they're building kind of an alternate, just like there's, a, there's a, an effort to build an alternate news ecosystem, there's also an effort to build an alternate information, kind of shared information resource. Um, so I don't know if this is going to end up, we're going to have left-wing Wikipedia and right-wing Wikipedia, but, but there is, I mean, you can kind of see this establishment of, of alternative channels, even at the kind of communal information level. So I'll go in. This is, this is my more recent work, and it involves kind of automation and what, what people are calling cyborgs, partially automated accounts or semi-automated accounts. Um, so you can see when when I when the first POTUS tweet was for when Trump had the um, he just got handed over the POTUS tweet. Um, the second reply on that tweet was was this was this account here, and I, it's been deleted since. I, I should have taken a screenshot of the actual tweet. Um, you know, I would you know this is this is a very much uh, seems to be an like an automated account. So I know bot is also a dirty word now. So I, I would say that you know there's a lot of automated. Account and account activity going on, especially on Twitter. So when the second reply on the first POTUS tweet ever is, is essentially, I would argue it's a bot. Um, I mean, this is this is the kind of scale that this is operating on. So here, here's a map of some of the larger, I would call them automated accounts or suspected automated accounts. Um, you can see in terms of network centrality, you know, it's they're all kind of mentioning Trump. It's very frequent. I mean, they're mentioning him. He's the center of the universe for for at least mentions. Um, so this is kind of, a, this is a political bot map, and I, you, can, you can see these on my blog as well. Um, but the kind of exposure these are getting, these, these sites are getting, or these accounts are getting, is massive. Um, every 100 tweets, I mean, we're talking a million impressions, and this gets into the, this gets into the point where what do these metrics mean anymore? And if, if we're getting this type of, you know, people are paying for this, just like just like YouTube, where you're you know you're having advertisers are having to pay for views. Um, the same type of thing exists on Twitter, and you know maybe this is why they're starting to miss their business model. Fifteen percent of their active accounts are bots. I mean, maybe this is why their financial forecast is off. So, when you map these types of um, again, when you go back to links, even on Twitter, and you map these types of ecosystems, what you get is you start to find that. These bots are posting um, sequentially on different types of political hashtags, very, very strategically. Um, they've been set up to amplify certain segments of, of politics and certain voices, and they're very time sensitive. I mean, as soon as a new topic comes out, these, the, the response for this is, is huge for these types of um, automated Twitter accounts. 
So and this, this is a map of uh, some of the accounts across the major political hashtags. So these aren't, so when you look at the content that these are um, involved with, this is from Russia. Um, and you know, one of the main things is they're still after Hillary. I mean, this is like, this is a recent, this is in January. Um, this, is, these are, this is a word cloud of the top terms coming out of these tweets from those accounts that I just showed. Um, so they're very time sensitive and they're very directed. So these accounts have been set up, some, some have been set up to target certain actors or certain topics, um, ranging from science all the way to, you know, specific people. So, like I said, I mean, a, a big part of this is, is the illusion of support, and I think that needs to be challenged because, I, you know, the, I mean, just looking at likes, I mean, gives a lot of people the impression that they have a lot of support. So here is the kind of largest um, take for, it's about 3,000 tweets, um, and this is from back in January as well. Um, this is one account, um, and I, I would argue that this account is the largest or the highest volume um, Twitter account for the election. Um, in 3,000 tweets, it got about 32 million impressions. So wh whether those are people, I mean, that's, that's, I guess that's the next question. We, we, have, we don't know if these, if these types of accounts, we don't know if it's, you know, it couldn't have reached 32 million people. We don't really know how many. But I mean, the numbers here are staggering. So you start to put these bots together and we're getting into hundreds of millions, you know, if not billions of fake views. Um, which in turn make things trend very quickly, or they can, you know, the kinds of power this, this has in terms of social networks and in terms of agenda setting for, for trending topics is very important. So these sites also, just, just to point out on some of the content here, these sites also kind of, there's a, there's a very interesting, like front page mag, for example, which is, which is kind of a fringe site. Um, you know, it looks a lot like Frontline for PBS. They're, they're kind of cloning some of the parts of designs for these, for these websites to make them look more credible, using the same colors, using the same fonts. And there are tools, I guess, as well to, to kind of run some of these accounts. So if you do suspect a, a Twitter account is automated or posting, you know, content links to things like front page. I mean, a, a good thing to do is to go back and there are tools called, one of them is called Bot or Not. It's, it's a pawn off of the old site called Hot or Not. Um, and it will, it does an analysis based on, on kind of network structure and the use of certain pronouns and terms and language. And it will give you a, an estimate of, of, you know, the likelihood that this thing, this account is automated. Um, and I think it's, a, it's a very interesting to look at. Th they seem to be getting better. Um, and these accounts, are getting better because, um, partly because people are logging in or to these uh, kind of hashtag rally networks and they're starting to, um, they're allowed to use their Twitter account from that point forward, but they also post their own tweets. So when you look at the sources of, of tweets coming from these accounts, you'll see that there'll be some kind of third party tool, but they'll also be Twitter web client. And in terms of detecting, uh, detecting automated automation or detecting kind of bots, it makes it much harder because you have, you have a human on there and you also have kind of an automated posting or a scheduled system. So going back to the idea that maps allow us, maps tell us direction. So when you, when you, kind of, when you have a map, it, it can take you places that you wouldn't normally have thought of or you wouldn't have um, suspected as, as something that could have kind of fake news content. When I was looking at the YouTube, because YouTube is kind of the center of the fake news universe in, in my first research, and I, I followed some of the links coming out of YouTube, what I found was uh, about 80,000 uh, YouTube videos that were, I would say automated. I mean, they, they had claimed that they have an AI system to, um, to kind of take content off of the web. They were scraping text, they were pulling the text in, and they were generating through AI uh, automated slideshow and a video, and it was all, all political news, basically all world politics, global politics. And these things were going up so fast that while, while I was trying to collect data, I mean, I don't know, a few hundred videos had already gone up. And so, I mean, again, this, you know, we have to, we have to look at the platforms for this, type of, for this type of abuse. I mean, the fact that 80,000 videos are being spooled over 13 different channels, um, just keyword stuffed, I mean, they, they it violated basically every, every kind of term that YouTube has. Um, this, this type of thing, the maps can take you places that you wouldn't normally expect through other types of analysis. So I, I think that network analysis is very important at this point in time. And let's see what else I... 
what else I have here? This is, uh, this is an example of one of these uh, networks. Um, it's PJNet. Conservatives probably know it. It's Patriot Journalist Network. Um, they have live hashtag rallies. You log in, um, you authenticate your account, and then once you do that, you know, they, they, their, their posts can go directly to these people's accounts. So this is also why you, 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 know, you see an account that was created in 2012 that looks automated, and it doesn't really make sense. And it kind of once, but once you start thinking about it, um, they're, they're kind of targeting people to, to join these types of initiatives and you know, live hashtag rallies, um, networks, patriot type networks. So the last thing I want to kind of say is in terms of links and maps, is that when you follow these links, again, one of the sites of interest was CNS News. It's a site that I, you know, you, no one is, most people have never heard of it. Um, it's one of these kind of rising sites that are sponsored more or less by the Trump administration. Uh, one American News Network is a similar type of, type of project. Um, but when you look at the, the, the time sensitive um, search results here, uh, and the kinds, of, the kinds of things that they're ranking first in sites like Google, um, a site that you've never, I mean, it doesn't have many links coming in, it doesn't have many internal links, it's not, I mean, it just, it's not that important. The fact that it's ranking number one for Obama gay marriage, um, transgender mental illness, um, so all sorts of very time sensitive uh, kind of political topics is, is astounding. So I think that look, going back and looking through these links and looking at the linking ecosystem to see how this is happening and to kind of make sense of this um, is, is important. Uh, one roadblock in doing this and looking and going back and kind of reverse engineering some of these links is, of course, opaque algorithms. So we don't know how, we, you know, we'll never know exactly how these things are being ranked, just like Facebook newsfeed. I mean, we, it's unclear. Uh, we know some of the social signals that, that help boost certain types of content or help get con help your content or page reach the web, but we, we don't know exactly how these things are ranked or sorted. And it's very, this, you know, this, this has been a marketing problem or SEO problem for years, but when you're getting suggestions for hate speech and kind of hate content, it becomes a different story. Um, so, I mean, you'd be getting into kind of regulation at this point, but um, the fact that we don't know how, we're, how kind of our reality is being made or, or is at least mediated is, is very important. So, I think that's the last. I can show some larger. I don't. I don't know if it, you know, the screen is so small that it's going to be hard to kind of show anything. But you can go to my Medium post, which I'll share on the Twitter, um, on the IJF Twitter, and I will right. sit down. Yep. Great. That's fantastic. Thanks very much, Jonathan. So if you'd like to sit down there, and Renee Kaplan from the FT will join us as well. Um, I imagine that you've got lots of questions. Well, did everyone understand all of that? Was that all completely clear? Um, I found it extremely complex. I'm sure you've got questions. We'll come to them in a second. But I just want to give Jonathan a chance to catch his breath. And I want to get your reaction there, Renee, because when I look at that, um, I think in terms of audience engagement, um, that just seems quite incredibly effective. I mean, Jonathan said a lot of this is uh, fake, fake uh, engagement, that the numbers are inflated. But in terms of occupying a space, it, it does seem quite incredible. What's your, give me your reaction to, to that. You need to press the green button on the bottom left. Um, first of all, thank you. That was both fascinating um, and terrifying, um, actually, in a way. Um, and um, but also marvelous, because it is probably the most powerful architecture of audience engagement that anyone could dream of. Um, and it is chastening to think that it can be so effective um, for a power, theoretically, that is bad. I mean, arguably, I'm, I'm taking a partial point of view here, but if we, if we do argue that for the most part, a lot of the information being distributed through this architecture um, is um, tendentious or biased or untrue, I'm not going to say fake news because that doesn't really mean much anymore, then arguably it's a bad thing. Um, but the effectiveness of it is, um, is, is marvelous, um, but disturbing, right? Because as you pointed out, um, the, it's breaking all the rules. It's breaking the rules of fair play. It's theoretically breaking the quite official rules, allegedly, of some of these platforms. 
um, it's essentially breaking the rules of any kind of code of journalism or storytelling or distribution that most news, official news, um, adheres to um, out of, in some ways, um, you know, ethical, um, ethical commitments. So all of which kind of leads me to, 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 to a question that I wanted to put back to you, which is, um, you know, mapping this structure and this flow is fascinating because we see what's happening. It kind of reveals to us um, this unbelievably effective system of distribution. But what then is the problem to be solved? Um, who, who's accountable? Um, I mean, it, it sort of begs the question of, well, what is to be done, actually? So I think that this is this is this is the ultimate question. I mean, how, how can we hold these types of uh, platforms? And and you know, there's there's no governing body for the internet, right? I mean, I mean, and you could and people are already arguing that you know there needs to be a UN for the web. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if that's the best solution. Um, I think that from a monetary perspective, I think that we need. I, mean, I think that, that individual people and individual consumers, especially, can can begin at least to hold some of these platforms accountable. Um, for inflated metrics, for and this is this is already happening because it's it's worth money, um, but I think that to a big to a larger, I mean, when, when we when we see things and recommendations on sites like Google, I mean, we need to call that out, and it's something that you know this gets into the argument where we're not you know we're not a media company, right? We're 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 just we're just kind of the middle men, or we're just the person in between um, the consumer and the content, but I think that. You know, in the types of delivery and the types of targeting that's happening right now, they, they know enough about us that they're serving these types of um, ads or they're serving these types of content or they're serving these types of search results. So I think that, you know, it, it has to fall back to some degree for, as a responsibility that these companies and organizations need to, need to consider as, as much more important, I mean, and, and beyond a PR kind of role and more of a, like a social, social awareness or social responsibility. Can I push you on that a tiny bit? When you say these companies, I mean, are we talking about the same old tech behemoths? Is it Google and Facebook and Twitter, to name names? Or in a sense, you, in a sense, does it operate outside of those as well? Because you were pointing out about email and so on. It, it does. I mean, I think that, but I think the first place to start, I guess my, my answer would be the first place to start would be with holding, you know, when you, when you can see YouTube. And, and now we're, seeing, we're starting to see some of the effects of YouTube right now. Um, you're getting, you know, videos are being served through kind of programmatic advertising on, on, you know, jihad videos essentially. So I think that, but I think a, a good place to start in, ter in terms of because a lot of the distribution of this does go through uh, YouTube. It's it's very very important. It's, it's it's the center of the propaganda universe, at least from the recent election. So, you know, beyond that, I mean, trying to regulate. Uh, Individual hate websites is going to be a whole different story, um, and again, that would fall back to you know the the, the fact that b beyond programming and beyond um, beyond design and kind of code, I mean, we have the W3C, but there's no really there's no real governing body. The web crosses national boundaries; it crosses you know geopolitics. So, I mean, this is kind of this is the question of I think the millennium of, is how how can we solve this this system that we've built that that spans the entire world? I mean, both in space and, and kind of time. My question as well, in a way to you, Renee, is when you look at that, you say it breaks the rules, but um, uh, my naive um, question might be, why isn't good information such as the Financial Times produces, why isn't that effective at filling that, that space? Right. So, so when I say it breaks the rules, um, it, it's, it's because, I mean, it, it's an information war to some extent, as you point out by saying, um, and even in warfare, um, in UN regulated warfare to some extent, there are um, rules of war and rules that you don't, that, that, that you know, rules of humanity, um, and those are pursuable crimes. So that's like the big abstract analogy. So basically, um, we're constrained, you know, we um, legitimate traditional media by what are ethical rules, um, by what are rules of fair play, um, by what are not so much rules as duties of accuracy. So one rule that, that actually is probably being quite explicitly violated in terms of YouTube standards is kind of the truffling of keywords, right? Where you, you, you basically, you, you 
stuff as many keywords that probably have absolutely nothing to do with a piece of content right. um, in order to game the optimization strategy. Um, you know, we, we do even see this actually among leg legitimate media that, that, that are on the sort of different ends of the spectrum. You have kind of a tabloid economy of media which are unbelievably powerful SEO machines that essentially are commissioning around all of the fairly basic rules to, in order to rank in Google. It's constant updating, fresh publishing, endless live blogging, um, you know, clickbait, things that are actually very normal and basic that we all not know, now know how to decode. There's a certain spectrum of media, and I'm going to put the Financial Times in them. We don't play by those rules because, or actually we don't break those rules. We, we, we play by the very traditional rules of accuracy and truth um, and saying what you're doing. Um, and, and not playing a game of optimization, but rather adhering essentially to what is a pretty traditional kind of honest distribution, but in an ecosystem where actually there isn't any governing body of rules that everybody has to adhere to. So it's sort of sad, but well, yeah, we're bound to lose. Right. Um, and for the most part, I guess the, the, the final word here is like, the, the, as we saw in your very large red piece and very small blue piece of that chart, the more traditional mainstream, more, less extreme right media are playing by the more traditional rules. Yeah, fascinating. Let's take some questions from, from the audience. And um, got one at the front and one there as well. Should we just take, let's try that trick of trying to take two at a time. So take you, sir, first. Yeah, thank you. My name is Andrei Suslink. I'm a journalist from Ukraine. Um, so basically you mentioned fake views which, uh, which is super important, I guess. And you mentioned also that the span is so fast, we can't really fight it. So my question is, if there is a chance that we can move as fast as this span moves, thank you. All right, yeah, I should just take that one quick, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know, honestly. I mean, because it's, it's hard. I mean, they're using like stream analytics now where I mean, things aren't stored to databases, but they're kind of pulled out of, out of a, a real-time stream. Um, I mean, these types of challenges are, I mean, some people say AI is eventually going to solve these types of things, or they're, they're going to use, they're going to use machine learning to understand and kind of pre-filter some of these types of, some of this content and some of the, some of the fake views. Um, you know, I, that's, I don't, I, that's a very difficult question. I mean, maybe there's, someone who works in technology would probably argue or, or say that there's a te technological solution to these types of, um, to these types of problems. Can I adopt something? Could you work in collaboration with Google or YouTube? And as you mentioned, YouTube is a center of universe for propaganda, and probably Google also does something of that, or at least is in the center of that. Um, when I went back, I, I waited for a while, and I was going to email YouTube directly. I thought it would be more effective just to post everything. I mean, I, I literally took the videos and I put them on GitHub, uh, 80,000 of them. So just, just, to make, I mean, just to make a statement and to get it out there, I thought it would be much more effective than emailing YouTube and probably never getting a response. Um, but I did go back last week and I noticed that a lot of the channels have been taken down for violation. So I mean, it, it, took, it, it took about a month, but I mean, it did kind of, I mean, these are clear violations. And, but I, again, you know, how, how can YouTube not see videos being uploaded every minute? Yeah. Uh, it just doesn't make much, I mean, tens of thousands. So can I just take next question there? No, no. I'm, t I'm not taking five minutes because the Wi-Fi was so shit. <laughs> I know you do, but t quick one there. I'm taking five minutes, please. Hi, no. my question is to Charlie Beckett, and it's very quick. You, br you wrote a month ago that fake news is the best that ever happened in journalism recently. Do you still hold this view? Yeah, I do. <laughs> just simply because the reaction of people in the game. Just Can I just take the question at the back there, please? Go back to there. Thank you. So I'll talk to you afterwards, but I think it's self-evident the reaction of people like Renee to this, this kind of information shows that it's creating um, great response. Jasper. So we're all here at this festival, so we, we assume the impact and the power of all this information and people reading it, but we, you know, with the fake news debate over the election, we still haven't been able to prove that it had an impact on the US election. What can we do to actually come up with the evidence that this is having an impact on people's beliefs and views and behaviours to actually get people to act, because yeah. that's, that's the key. Big question, I'm going to get both of you to answer that. Do you think in the end that it, it's having a real world impact? Absolutely. I mean, I, I definitely think there's, there's, you can see the effects of some of these, um, some of these campaigns. I don't know if all of these effects, you know, from, from the, especially from the elections and the Brexit are, are intended. I think there's a lot of unintended side effects and unintended consequences when they, when they set these kinds of 
uh, campaigns in motion, especially with targeting. I think that you know it it gets people kind of emotionally involved. I don't know how it's it's hard to wind that down after the election, especially when you have um, a provocateur in office, right? So, but I but I don't I don't think that a lot of this was intended. You know, they don't intend for hate crimes to happen after this, but but they did leverage, and I think there is some responsibility for the types of messaging that they use to push certain types of uh, viewpoints and agendas um, that are still being that it still exists now. Um, whether those are intended or unintended, I, you know, that's a, that's a whole different question. But Re yeah, Renee, what, what's your opinion? Yeah, I do think so for two reasons. I'll be quick. The first is that um, we already talked a lot about filter bubbles and social filter bubbles, um, and I think one of the most um, you know interesting things that that your that that your writing and your analysis reveals is that there's now an even bigger filter bubble, which is a, a, a bigger picture informational filter bubble, which is like a web bubble. So it's sort of you layer like your social filter bubble that you're in, and even a kind of a bigger search filter bubble of architecture, where you actually potentially a user, a reader, will never emerge from what is very much um, a partially loaded um, information universe. Um, so there's really no way out, actually. It's kind of like a maze to which there's no exit. Um, and the second reason is all of this kind of distribution of information and the way we're getting our information is changing the way we define good decision making and it's going away from factual towards visceral. Like it's actually now, I think, considered okay to make emotionally driven and viscerally driven decision making. Fantastic. We are going to leave it there. Help yourself. Talk to Jonathan Albright afterwards. Go and have a look at his Medium blog for more data. And perhaps we'll arrange a meeting between Jonathan and the platforms. Thank you, Renee. Thank you, Jonathan. Yes, I know. Yes. How, um, yeah, I, I, I thought I'd recognize because I, lo I looked up your profile and I, I thought it was you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. My, it's my, look at my newest post. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a new it's. Hi there. Good morning, everybody. Um, if you want to see the presentation this morning, can you turn off your Wi-Fi? Can, can everyone turn off their Wi-Fi? I'm really sorry about this, but the Wi-Fi in here is so appallingly bad that our only chance of getting Jonathan's presentation up is if you turn off your Wi-Fi, I'm told. So can you... Disconnect yourself from the internet, please.
Okay. Uh, just Okay, I think we've got the technical glitches figured out. Thank you for coming today. I am Jonathan Albright from Elon University. Sure. So we we think we can do this now. Um, you may have seen the news this morning. You may have seen the news from Syria. Um, about that the Americans have launched cruise missile strikes uh, in Syria, which I think reminds us that that American presidential election was incredibly important. And in a sense, perhaps, we've been kind of laughing about the idea of fake news, always with inverted commas, fake news, but it has real consequences. Um, today, we're, we, well, you've been talking uh, uh, the last day or two about um, fake news, what it looks like, and how you can 